Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. Hello, Jim. Hello, David. How are you doing today? I'm in a great mood. Can't you tell? I can't talk about why I'm in a great mood, but I'm in a great mood. And that's the most sarcastic I've ever been on this podcast all at once. Um, You can say that. Yeah. So we've had two episodes that basically failed. Um, Yeah. I the, the Apologies for the last two episodes never airing, and it has to do with the fact that OBS... Though the meters were running while we were recording, was not yeah. actually recording anything because for whatever reason, the output was not being routed somehow. There was something going on with my interface, and I think it had an update, and I think I had to go back and like reselect it, even though the audio mixer was working properly. So whatever. I, I You know what? I can't even with OBS. We're going to have some stuff like this happen once in a while. Hopefully it doesn't happen consistently. Um so, yeah, apologies for that. But we're going to try to cover a lot of the information that we covered in the last two episodes. Um, there were some interlinked topics. I think we did a lot of uh, what's new with Jim. And uh, I think we'll probably start off with with that. Unless you want me to start off with the ad I had on uh, Reverb. Start with the ad because that was okay. so enjoyable. I think we should re- rehash that. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you. I'm pulling it up now. Um, so I'm going to flash at the bottom of the screen when we edit this. But uh, what this is, uh, aside from totally, utterly, completely hilarious, is a, I'm just going to read the description. Actually, I'm not going to describe the guitar before I read the description. I think, I think to get the pure comedy value out of it, we need to start with the description. <laughs> so um, the, this is a GS Mini Koa Acoustic Electric. The pyrography on the koa top represents the melding, as well as the division of Spanish and Native American cultures and history. Sites such as Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Bogota, Lima, and Santiago <laughs> are embodied by this dichotomy. Wood fire burst design on the back. <laughs> also available in light mahogany, spruce wood electronics. Um, <laughs> this is. This is a wood fired Koa GS Mini Koa acoustic electric from Koa, uh, from Taylor Koa. Um, and I, I honestly like, I, I'm all for wood fired art, but they've yeah. done a number on this thing. This thing was hit with a blowtorch. Okay. Um, you can see the back of the guitar is clearly separating from the, bi- not from the binding, but from the bracing. Um, because they hit it with so much fire that it's like curling up. And I think um, they forgot that what holds a guitar together is glue. Yeah, and the art on it's kind of cool, but but it doesn't pass the Ryan Burke art test. That's that's important to point out. So like it 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 looks great if it's hanging on the wall, but it won't look great while you're playing it because the art runs you know in the wrong direction. Right. Um, yep. And uh, you know, I, I I I hesitate to say this is like a really slick thing, right? So they even burn the label on the inside, which makes me wonder like what kind of fire are they hitting this thing with? Um I, I didn't realize that when we covered this in the when we did the, the original recording of this, but it it's clearly jacked up. Okay. Yeah. Um oh, yeah. now here's the best part, folks. So this guitar has been brutalized beyond belief. Um yeah. it's being the pictures so are would- being the picture it would the, normally be about uh what maybe 350 400 dollars used yeah yeah i mean and in in our current climate 500 dollars used um max max uh, well, that was what they would list it at it's not going to sell for that right. um and in the background you can see a sailboat and they're on this dock you know and it's like you got all this money that you can like literally just burn quality guitars and on top of that the price tag for this bad boy is a whopping seventeen hundred dollars. Seventeen hundred dollars. When when you put that. Oh up. yeah, yeah, seventeen hundred dollars. If this was the Price Is Right, I'd be wrong because this guitar probably should be no more than five hundred bucks total. Did, I, did you? So if you if you go to uh, his site, 
uh, his his store, I should say, within Reverb, uh, what you get is a whole bunch of these things, a whole litany of is that the right word? Yeah. Um, of yeah. uh, a plethora <clears throat> of, of pyromania. Yeah. <laughs> a plethora. A plethora oh, of pyromania. We're having a we're having thunderstorms. So if you guys hear them, that's what's going on. That's what's up. So anyway, um, yeah, there's a whole plethora. <laughs> I know it's plethora. I'm just making fun of the word. I, I, it's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, and and it's just funny to me that um that this guy expects to get this kind of money. He's had several of these things up for sale for quite some time. Yeah. Um, the Les Paul jumped out at me because it it's not a Les Paul. It's an inexpensive guitar that is Les Paul. It's like a Les Paul. A but hey, you know what? This is the right thing to do with a Chipson. Burn it. Um, and, so, <laughs> and that's what he did. He was like, you know what? Maybe I should burn this. And that's what he did. Um, he, he has a tendency, or she. This I, I don't know. I think the the person's name was a male name, right? That was I don't name. remember. Uh, I can look at my... or something like that. Yeah, um, seems like it. Dallas, Texas. Oh, I, I don't have, think I have a screenshot of their their uh, store name, but uh, if you're interested, I can give it to you. Oh no, it's Geppetto's right. Guild. Geppetto, like da- yeah, like Geppetto uh, from from uh, Pinocchio. So yeah, it it's funny um and uh but i i don't know if i could take a single one of the things that he's done seriously enough to make the problem with charging that kind of money for an artist because that's really what you're paying for is the art you're not paying for the guitar let's face it you're not buying that guitar to play it playing to hang it right i hope so i hope so because i mean i I actually like the art on this guitar it's got a yeah it's got a bandito And a skeleton yep. bandito and a um yeah. a skeleton it looks like a Native American with a with a wolf's head hat on and like a the the helmet type deal. And then there's like a yeah, snake coming out of his that. mouth and all, and that stuff's yep. cool. But I just the burning of the rest of the guitar is like insane. It's, it's way it's, it's over the top. Pointless. It's pointless. And the other part of it is, like I said, they've already they've already separated the glue. If it's not broken already, yeah. it's gonna break. Um possibly the shipping. But um uh, furthermore, and probably more importantly, um, the reason that I say it's just a piece of art, if you were to play that, where would your arm go? You'd, right you'd over the cover. art. Yeah, you cover the art. And the, I believe these guitars are a satin finish, aren't they? Yeah. So Yeah, they are. I mean, I hope it's burnt deep because it ain't going to yeah. last very long. Um, no. I, you know, and, you'd and have to lacquer that. That would be my biggest concern with buying something like this is like, how stable is that neck now that you've torched it? And I know people are doing this. This is like a popular thing right now, torching electric guitars. I think it, it kind of makes more sense in a bolt on where you can remove the neck when you burn the body. But like, yeah, that's not what they yeah. did here. Um, I know these are bolt on guitars, but I don't think they took the neck off. Like it doesn't look like they did. Um, it looks like they actually, in one part of it, it looks like they tried to avoid the neck pocket. Um, because they obviously knew that, you know, you shouldn't do that. Um, I do like the the red stripe up the middle of the guitar. I don't know how they pulled that off. Um, well, I you, think that's a good look for this guitar. When we discussed this last time, you remember I showed the Les Paul and it, and it was it. They had literally removed the neck. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, but my point or it came off because they melted the glue. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good. We didn't even think about that. that with that joint. Um, so what I'm thinking is um, they're trying to sell it, obviously, based on the artwork, because even if you were to buy it, let's say 350, you were buying it as a guitar. So let's say four hundred dollars. That's a realistic price point for that guitar used. Artwork is worth another thirteen hundred. That that is really subjective. And that must be that that has to be an artist for which there is a, 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 a an we, audience. Can we talk for a minute about art? Can we talk for a minute yeah. about, about this art right here? Yeah, because that's a beautiful cat. I mean, look at it sticking its <laughs> tongue out of This is my Tower of Power cover for the cats so that they don't destroy my uh, amp covers. Um, I actually have covers for my amp covers. Um, that's how, how good I take my gear. But, but it, my point is, like, look, this, that, there's two different styles of art. They're art. I pay 
five or ten bucks for this, right? Yeah. I'm gonna pay nine hundred bucks for this. Why? Um, yeah, exactly. And the other part I want to posit here: look, people, I'm not slamming people's art. Um, I just don't think if you're gonna spend more than three hundred bucks to get a tattoo, you shouldn't spend more than three hundred bucks to get art on your guitar. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I don't know because I don't know the process. Um, I'm not a wood burner. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, and then that's a big part of it. The guy from Arts and Rec, the guy that played um, Ron Swanson. Well, I've been seeing. He, he actually does that. Stuff. I've been seeing this stuff on that uh, that that service that sells our, our information to China, where they yeah. you know they do this wood burning art and they're using like gunpowder actually to do it. Um, yeah. Because it because it burns quickly and it leaves a mark and all. Yep. Um, and I these don't look like they were done with gunpowder. These look like this is somebody's work with uh, a hand tool. Um, which is, you know what? That's awesome. Um, and I love it, but it may not be marketable art. And right. So that's where I'm I, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable with that over, over like maybe $700, maybe 800. And, and again, it's because I can't appreciate and that's, and that's again, speaking to the marketability of the art, I could not possibly appreciate the work. That went into this. Someone who knows might say, Jim, that took him uh, or her uh, uh, six months because you have to do this and then you have to let it sit. And then you it, have to do it's this. entirely no. possible. Um, but then I, I would say I, the end the end result is cool looking, but you've rendered the guitar basically useless. And for me, right. like the guitar in itself is a work of art. And so I'm yep. cool with it not having, you know, this frilly stuff extra on it yep. and making it at an affordable price. Um, yeah, so that's my. Two and cents. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a tough thing. We talk about expensive guitars because we're going to roll into acoustics at some point in this. Plus, we have to talk about my gear issues, which are like all over the place now. <laughs> two weeks, two weeks were lost. We got to talk yes. about a lot of stuff. Yeah, now. there's a lot of stuff that's happened. <laughs> but um, uh, the the fact is that people buy guitars sometimes because they love the way they look, wasn't it? Yeah, that. Oh my god. We're, we're, and we're going to do, are we doing an hour tonight? I don't no, know. I think the episode where I psychoanalyzed you actually did come out. Oh, it did? Yes, where um, we'd established that Jim buys guitars because they look cool. I buy guitars because they function. <laughs> that's basically, yeah, and, that's and it you know in a nutshell. A lot of people, people do that. I'm looking at a Tesla next. I mean, that's. It's now design it's over function. <laughs> well, actually, I think that's function too because I like. I think it's well. function as well, but there's right. a, there's design beyond um, the functionality. I could get around in a much cheaper car. He does right now, folks. I, I do. I get around in a car that costs me nothing um, because I own it. Um, well, so, it, it costs you the gas money. Yeah, it costs me gas and and oil and all that stuff, tires and rotation mm -hmm. and everything else. But uh, the point is that there's um. There is definitely um, a market, am I using the right word, for these kinds of things. Um, I just... I think the so market's smaller, though. Room, right? I have a huge painting in my living room. And the, and the oh. painting is worth, like, I guess, somebody told me it's like an $800 or $1,000 painting. It's one of it's one of 100,000 numbered signs and everything else. And, and I'm like, not to me. Uh, somebody gave it to me for free or it wouldn't be hanging there. I, I definitely wouldn't have picked this out. So. <laughs> I just and the funny thing is, like people cle people clearly come into Jim's house and notice this painting, and they're like, they "That's do? amazing work, Jim." Yeah, you, yeah. You have a really good eye, and you're like, "Really?" I picked it off the garbage heap of my neighbors. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that bad. No, I know. Um, it would be, it's I have, funny. I have been um, that guy who said, "Are you throwing that stuff out?" And uh, at my um, apartment when I was living in an apartment about 10 years ago. And, and yeah, yeah. Uh, can I get that painting? It was because I love huge paintings because they take up a lot of wall space. You don't have to do anything with it. Gosh. Um, <laughs> Behind them are like various <laughs> holes where Jim hides things. And it's, it's canvas. No, 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 it's no hiding holes or anything. That's what that, that stuff is doing. <laughs> you know how many times I hug this piece of wood before I got it. <laughs> and it, you do not know how many holes are behind where the guitars like they were there were like three and then I went, no, I can put four in here. Maybe here we five. are. No, here like we are one. talking about this burnt guitar and Jim's house is no longer structurally stable because he he uh hung up a two by four. 
Yeah. <laughs> There's actually another one over here. Oh, I know. <laughs> Guitars over here. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty funny. But um, anyway, the point is that the artwork is is so totally subjective. Um, I was talking to my daughter today, and we were talking about Facebook, and of course, I'm taking a few months. From talking about anything, but except for guitars, puppies, and um, I hear uh, you, man. Because it, it's just going you'll be insane. a lot. You'll be a lot healthier at the end. Trust me. Oh yeah, because I don't even want to look at this stuff. But the 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 thing is, so I'm you know I've got my Game of Thrones. That's a Game of Thrones uh, lamp there. That's a that's the throne and the and the map. But anyway, so I'm I'm a person who doesn't care. That's an Iron Maiden poster right there. I'm trying to point to it because it's a calendar. Yeah, it's an Iron Maiden calendar. And I've got like an artwork um, of guitars and stuff over here. It's a giant canvas painting. And I've got the canvas painting all over. And you remember when I only had a couple of pops? Remember I had like... Yeah, he has too many like, of them now. Big surprise, folks. Uh, the hoarder is have, back. I literally have $1,300 of pops now. What? Um, and that's not what I spent. That's what their value is now. I oh thought. yeah, that's what their value is. Yeah, let me know how those sell for you. Hey, I'm not selling them. I'm just saying. I um, know. I, I so, know. I know. I always laugh when people are like, "Oh, it's valued at," and I'm like, "Yeah, it's valued at." Really? <laughs> the, the truth of the matter is, when it comes to those things, some of them sell for a lot more, and some of them sell for a lot less. And it just depends on what's. I mean, it's just like anything else when it comes to stuff like that. What's on the market currently, and what can you get? from the audience that exists now right and i think that's a that's a tough thing it's a tough sell um you know we we've talked about the spark and we've talked about the the uh the helix and we've talked about the camper we've talked about the and every time it's still literally a subjective thing no one can say a guitar amplifier is worth this much no. Where does the value come from? It's implied. Uh, the yeah. implied value of the market, which, I mean, even that is kind of subjective. I, 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 th we all know that there is a cost associated with when they build something, and cost is a big part of that conversation, and that yeah. we have definitely seen some things that cost more than they should, and therefore have yeah, exactly. a inflated value. Um, but at the same time, it's when you're especially and i've always always said this like if you look at the used market and you look at what sells for you look at the high end the low end and the middle and then you find what your average is you take the outliers and that's your value right so um the problem even there is that it's that there can be things like hype that are driving that value i don't believe that strymon pedals used should be twenty dollars under strymon pedal new value I mean, that's I, that's a personal bias I have, but I look at that situation. I go, come on, guys, it's you. We've got two. We've got two used ones in the market in the area, and they're both priced at exactly what the new one is. Now, of yeah. course, that that doesn't. Well, they know they're going to get an offer lower than that, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a buyer's market on that. It really shouldn't. Um, Strymon is a pretty big company now. I mean. We used to, I think we had an argument about that on the show one time, but I think we pretty much established that Strymon's bigger than they used to be because there was a time right. when they were, you know, a dozen people and now there's 40 or 50 of them. Um, yep. And so if that's the case, why are there, pet I mean, is it really value or is it a hype? And right. that's where, that's where I think that's, that's why I was pointing out this tulip mania, right? Everybody wants it. So obviously it's worth more, except that it's not really worth more. It's just that, you know, not a whole lot of them sell. And so the ones that do sell, sell at almost, you know, new value or whatever. And it just becomes a whole like vicious cycle. Um, right. I'm not, look, I'm not saying value has anything to do with the quality of something. Um, we all know 70 strats are going up. We all know that most 70 strats are not that great. Um, Again, it's, I think that's another hype machine. If you look, um, I, I watched a video the other day that said uh, the same thing you've been saying where the guy said, uh, <clears throat> um that uh there were 1400 um les pauls made uh sunburst les pauls made in 1959 uh, of which only 2000 are left so oh it, it's higher than it's that saying, yeah but yeah, yeah. But 
Yeah, similar joke. In other words, you know, there's there, there weren't that many. But because the records, it was that thing uh, one of our show listeners shared about um, going down the rabbit hole about those things, where um, Gibson is offering for some... thousand dollars, I think, for the record books, the ledgers. Yeah, because they want to start validating what's what. Um, yeah. And the funny part about it is, so, you know, you know who started this whole thing, right? Um, the, the whole counting, like there are 3,059 less pulse in circulation, but only 1,400 were made. That was Ed Roman. Right. Ed Roman was a yeah. big proponent of that. And Ed Roman's whole thing was somebody actually asked him, and I think it ended up on his website at one point they, before his death, obviously. Um, somebody asked him, how do you know that there are 3,000 in circulation? And he said, because I know I counterfeited at least 400 of them. So <laughs> it's like, it's, it, I, I mean, honestly, like if somebody's admitting that they made 400 of them, you know, he's not the only <clears throat> dude that was doing it. And he said oh, yeah. he was participating with a bunch of East coast. Cause he used to have a shop on the East coast with a bunch of East coast shops. And they all had a system down. Like one guy would do the neck, and one guy would do the bodies. And then they'd throw them up on the roof for three weeks to, to age them. And it was a whole, like they had a whole process. Um, well, Yeah. So it comes, it really comes back to this, unless you're buying, and, and even then it can be fishy in some, some places, but unless you're buying like, like myself with the, with the Les Paul that I've got here from a store where you can validate, um, truthfully all the way back. Um, I had to validate that thing all the way back to Gibson. Right. Let me, let me ask you a question um, though. How important is validation? Cause honestly, if I had, if, if well, I had an I Ed Roman, talking. if I had an Ed Roman fake and it was a badass guitar, it's still a badass star. And that's that's exactly <laughs> what I was talking about in the beginning. That Thank you for bringing that full circle. And that is this. Who says how much that amp is worth? And who says how much that guitar is worth? And, and the thing is just, it, yeah, you do. You do. And if you're willing to pay that price and you're willing to go down and buy that item, right, then you are 100%. Um, that that excuse me that guitar has that value and so you can't say or that amplifier whatever it is that painting that um <laughs> that taylor mini has that value because you were willing to pay it and it, it gave you that much and this is the thing that people we i think we talked about this before it gives you joy yeah right yeah uh, it's the marie kondo method which is does it give yeah, you joy that, does it bring you joy yeah and and in and in truth, in truth, I mean, I've let a lot of stuff go because it didn't bring me joy, and I've kept I've kept things that I probably should have let go because they bring me joy. And in yeah. all honesty, like that's directed a lot of my conversation. Now, originally, when we did this episode, we did a whole segment talking about value and how you really shouldn't care about the value of something. It should it shouldn't be all that important. But I think this is actually a better way to approach that topic, which is that hey, here we are, here we're sitting and talking about this, and. Here's a GS Mini. It's a $500 acoustic guitar. It's had all kinds of stuff done to it, and it might be valueless. It might be literally worthless because it's unplayable. So in my hands, it would be worthless. It, to the guy that collects art, it might be cool. Now, um, on the other side of that, you know, I've played, I have been humbled so many times with inexpensive guitars that... I feel like I'm a hypocrite every time I talk on this show and say something like, well, you know, Squire's really not where I want to be and stuff. They, everybody makes good products. Um, I think the commentary that I have and I want to share with everybody is it's consistency. And that's, that's a big part of why I kind of avoid the budget level stuff that, and um, when you get into budget pedals and stuff, you don't really know what you're getting. A lot of times it's like, well, here's this pedal and it's an exact copy of this other pedal. But if you put them side by side, one of them's noisy as hell and the other one's quiet. One of them has better dynamics, but they basically sound the same, you know, or or that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And classic examples, I had a Cool Cat. Um, what was it? The Cool Cat. It was their OCD clone. I can't remember which one. I, did, I can't remember which one it was. It was oh, a yeah. silver enclosure, right? When they did the, uh, it was Dan Electro Cool Cat. When they did the silver, right. the, the metal enclosure series. Um, and I put that to my OCD and it did sound approximately like my OCD in one of the modes. Um, I can't even remember which one. I think it was the, the high pass. Um, but did that mean that that was the right tool for the job? Because I don't always use the high pass mode and it was cheap 
and it was noisy, real noisy, like three times as noisy as the OCD um, from Full Tone was. Um, so yeah. I I had it for a while. I was using it for a second OCD sound on my board, and I finally just said, you know what, I don't need this. And I actually gave it to somebody um, because it was it was inexpensive. Uh, you <laughs> you can afford to use a fifty dollar pedal for a couple of months and kind of get bored with it and be like, you know what, I got this friend over here. He actually needs one. I'll just give this to him. I did that with my tuna melt, Dan Electro tuna melt um, tremolo pedal. I gave it away. They're a really good brand to get involved with if you've never had pedals before. Um, I think today, if you've never had pedals before, you probably want to look at like TC Electronic and Boss. Um, I, I know that the price of entry is obviously higher, but I think when you get down to those dollar values in cheaper pedals, there are companies like Joyo that are out there. I don't think they give you the same bang for the buck. Eh, Joyo's pretty good. I haven't really had a bad Joyo product. Um, yeah. Except that there are obviously like ethical implications of buying something from Joyo because, uh, you know, they are basically just straight copies in a lot of cases. Um, but you know, if that's all you got money wise, it's an option. Um, and, uh, I mean, you upgrade later if you decide you want to go yeah. with something with a lower noise floor or, you know, better build quality or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's another thing I've seen with Joyo is a lot of proprietary parts, but, um, I don't know, man. Um, I kind of feel like, uh, the value thing is, is, has been well stated. I, I do want to talk about acoustics, though, because the reason I was looking yep. at this GS Mini was because I'm in the market for an acoustic, right? Yep. So I've been playing with Old Stumpy, which is um, my bluegrass, uh, folky, top 40s thing. Top 40s of yesteryear. We don't really do any new music. Um, yeah. And it has come to my attention that... What? No Katy Perry? No, no top 40. Well... If you meet Kyle, our singer, I think you'd understand why we don't do Katy Perry. Um, Cause some of the, it, I, it actually would be funny and he, he probably would be willing to do it. Um, Cause he's, he's a sharp guy work. and yeah, he would totally yeah. like, it would just be funny. Um, yeah. Nobody would, nobody would be looking at him and being like, well, this is terrible. Why is this guy doing this? They would just laugh because they would know yeah. this is a gag. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I would describe uh, Kyle affectionately as like a lumberjack. He's a bigger dude, right. full beard, you know, kind of thing. And like, um, you could see him out chopping wood. Like I could see him out in the woods with like a big flannel on chopping wood. Um, in fact, I think he's wearing a flannel right now, probably. Uh, anyway, um, we were having this conversation about, about acoustics and like one of the things that he does a lot of is he plays uh, farmer's markets and he often plays them by himself. It's been a question right. between him and I. It's like, well, can we get the whole band to do this? And we've been excluded a couple of times and I don't know if I it's, muted. I don't know if it's because, um, I really don't know what the deal is. Like why, why I haven't gone to these farm reference shows or whether he's just going by himself and it's not a big deal. I don't, I said, don't really care about the money from that band. If I get money, great. Um, but it's, it's more of a fun thing. And, uh, so anyway, we're, we were having this conversation. It's become very clear that like, it would be nice for me to have an acoustic guitar so I could go sit into some of this stuff and uh have the ability to do that without having to lug an amplifier and all that kind of thing so i'm not an acoustic player never really have been my acoustic is a 200 dollar ibanez and that's 200 dollar used value um yeah it is uh it sits in a case probably for a year at a time um i i am amazed this guitar does not have a crack in it or something or that it's not st got structural problems it might have structural problems for all I know. I've never had it had it set up and never had it into a tech. Um, I kind of don't want to have it set up and take it to a tech. It's one of those guitars that it might break. <laughs> I bought it. I was like 18 when I bought it. I'm 35 now. And the funny part is when I bought it, like it was like, oh yeah, this is, you know, really cool. I really want an acoustic and it has this like flame rosette on it and stuff. And then I'm like, and like, by the time I'm 21, I'm looking at him and going, why would you ever buy an acoustic guitar with a flame rosette? Like, that is the dumbest thing. Like, what were you thinking? Um, our our uh, uh, opinions of art change. <laughs> very quickly. Very quickly. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I have this guitar. I don't play it. I'm probably going to sell it off and get a decent acoustic. So I'm looking for a parlor size. And that's actually the interesting part of this conversation. Uh, why a parlor, right? Everybody's like, oh, parlors yeah. suck because they sound terrible. And um, here's my use case. 
the other guitar player has a giant dreadnought acoustic. He sings in a baritone voice. Um, the we have a uke play, player in the band. We have a bass player in the band, and we also have a drummer who is uh, plays with brushes. He plays fairly quietly, so actually he could probably sit in with his, some of these acoustic things um, and get away with it without having without having us mic'd up. Maybe the singer will have to be mic'd, but but the guitars could be loud enough. Um, and we were talking about it and it was like, well, I need a guitar that's going to fit within the context of what we already have. And getting another dreadnought is not going to help that. Okay. I want something that's going to have that mid range punch, like an electric guitar will, because that's kind of where I sit with my electric guitar anyway. So right. it would kind of fit for me to go down the same path slash Avenue um, to fit into this situation. So, right. um, I have options. I'm looking at the GS mini. I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at parlors from other people. I, there's a, a PRS parlor. I'm going to look at. There's the parlor from breed love, um, the concertina, which is apparently a freaking stellar guitar. Um, and they have those at all price ranges, which means I'm not going to be yeah. limiting myself to a budget entry level. Like this is focused on people who really don't want to spend a big money on a guitar and don't really want to have to store it kind of deal where I can get something that's like, no, this is a pro quality guitar. It's just made for this form factor because it has a different voice. Um, and that's kind of how I'm looking at it, but it's, I look, I don't want to spend a ton of money because I'm kind of looking at it and going, Man, I would really much rather spend my money on electric because chances are I'm going to play that electric a lot more than I'm going to play this acoustic. But at the yeah. same time, it's like I really need to get a good acoustic, you know, and even if it's a parlor, right. I, I can fit that into any band. Nobody plays parlor guitars on stage. You get a quality nope. one. You're going to be golden. You're never going to have to be like, well, I better get the Martin for the show because they're all playing Taylor's. Or I better get the Taylor for this show because they got two Martins or two Martins and a Gibson on stage, you know. Yep. And the and the reason why you would all of those guitars have distinct voices. I think Martin certainly has like a fingerprint. I think Taylor has a fingerprint. I think um, PRS has a fingerprint because actually PRS acoustic guitars are pretty decent. I know a lot of people yep. don't give them very much love. They kind of put them in the same ballpark as like Fender acoustics. But all these different brands have a different sonic fingerprint. And um, that's part of the way that I've always like decided what I'm going to do. Um, I bought an I bought an Ibanez because a lot of the other guys I was playing with had Epiphones and they had Fenders, and I sort of knew that my Ibanez acoustic was going to sound different, and it did sound right. different than the, than the uh, Epiphones and Fenders that I was playing at the time when I was looking. Um, but in this case, I mean, it's about finding the right guitar at the right price point, and I think that's partially because. Um, it looks like this year is going to shake out to be pretty good financially for me. Um, you know, we've had some actually kind of strange success uh, with just, you know, putting money away and those kinds of things. So I may take the big money I was planning to buy, like a really expensive guitar and go roll it into an amplifier or something. Uh, something we discussed on the show recently, or I might buy a better interface, which that is something that I will use. Um, that persona is, is really doing that persona. I hate this thing, man. I really do. Uh, one of our show listeners, Jeff, Jeff Biesiadecki, uh, reached out to me. He's uh, he's using his FM3, his uh, Fractal FM3, and he wants Spitif. And he says uh, he wants to get a pr this persona interface that I have or something similar so that he can get the Spitif inputs. And I'm like, don't do it. Don't. Don't. He's like, well, it'll probably be different on Mac. And I'm like, no, don't try it. <laughs> you know, I have the high ground, Anakin. And yeah. that priest on a center face is like, you underestimate my power. Um, yeah. yeah. So this has been your Star Wars reenactment. With I have the high ground, Anakin. Yeah. yeah, I do have the high ground on this one. I'm going to drop this thing through the, the, through the goalposts of life. Um, I would throw up my toilet, but my toilet handle's broken. That's the project for tomorrow night is fixing my toilet Wait, do you handle. have to write the copy when you're selling it? I really love this thing. It oh, is no. awesome. I'm just going to be like, for sale, Presonus 1810C, low mileage. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be no comments on like, this thing was a great service animal for, no, this thing is a piece of crap. And I will not sell it in our user group and I refuse to sell it to a show listener. Um, unless Jeff wants it. If Jeff really wants it, like 
talk to yeah, me. Talk go. to me, man. I'll uh, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you an Jeff, offer you can't you know, refuse. You, you gotta you gotta take him up on it. Um, I, I will I will freely admit that the Presonus interface is the reason we had the two episodes disappear. So I'm yep. I'm reasonably willing to say that. Um, oh, I have another thing planned for the end of the year that's audio related too. Uh, I want to get another Mac. And I want to get a laptop this time. I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to have. Yeah, um, I would get a MacBook Pro. And that's it's just going to be for recording. I'm not, I'm not going to yep. dirty it up with a bunch of other crap. I mean, like I'll have my email and stuff in there, but um, I don't really want to use it for anything work related. Um, if anything, I'm working off my home PC for work right now. And I want to say, if you're doing that, uh, hats off to you because I, I, I totally understand where you're at. You can't get away from work. You can't. Yeah. Like, even if, even if you're doing something else, you're still sitting there in front of the same place where you work every day. But the other component of that is that it starts dirtying up your computer and I'm, I'm just, I'm done with it. It's right here. I need to have my, I need to have my worlds separate, you know? And so from now on, all the work crap and go on the laptop or on the, on this desktop right here for now while COVID's going on and I can do all my music. I hear you. End of the day, I can go in the bedroom and get out my other laptop and do all my music stuff. Amen, brother. So, Amen. I'm serious. I so um, I'm looking probably. I, I'm still I'm still looking at possibly getting a Kemper. So I should probably talk a little bit about what's happened. So yeah, because yeah, we I, haven't even we haven't even touched the the Helix debacle. Let's yeah, let's finish with the with the acoustic stuff. So I obviously bought this one. That's my yeah, the Gibson Gibson um, hummingbird. Yeah, hummingbird. <laughs> it is. It's a hummingbird. I, I know, but I'm I'm putting in air quotes because it doesn't have all the fancy hummingbird features on it. Oh yeah, no. the aesthetic stuff. But it doesn't even hold on. See the pick guard. It's even not got the fancy little uh, thing. Uh, the, the the second fancy pointy spot that's usually right there right yeah there. yeah um it's only got one fancy pointy spot it actually it in person it actually really looks like it's still wet oh, like I, it's green. oh i know I, people love pick guards man and they love the uh the hummingbird pick guard and stuff i actually think yeah. yours looks better i'm not a big fan yeah. of super ornamental guitars i mean i did yeah, buy a guitar with know. a flame rosette so i would feel bad playing that darn thing because i'd be like oh no i scratched the the hummingbird um so I would like buy it and then it would become a four thousand dollar freaking um wall hanging. But um so this is only hanging behind me because I'm still trying to get my video done for the spark. Then it'll go into case because I have the um I have the humido humidifiers. Yeah, the, the humidifier system and all that. Yeah. Yeah, it's really I mean it's super cheap. A lot of people talk about it, they go, Oh my god, it must be no, it's thirty bucks, guys. Thirty bucks for the well, for how- the original and it's twenty bucks to refill it. Oh, so you're using the humidity pack thing? Yeah, the desk type thing. Yeah. How how often do you change them out? Um, you can go years without changing it out. It really depends because what it does is it acts like a, a an active desk. So it's it's gooey, right? It's all gooey. You put it in the packets, and you put uh, there's two packets for the body area, and there's one that you set behind the um, headstock. Oh, I always thought it was mo- it actually released moisture. No, it does. So what those do is they're kind of reverse desiccant, okay. right? Because desiccant say, is, hard is like drying out. Yeah. Right. And so these things are gooey. So what they do is they sit in there and when they get hard, you're supposed to replace them. So they're releasing enough fluid, enough um, humidity to keep the humidity level inside the case between 40 and 60%. So uh, they work. According to, I think what I read, it's around uh, um, just above 50 that they're shooting for. Um, So what that will happen, this is the funny part, is if it gets too humid in there, they suck it back in. Okay, so So, the system you're using is two to six six months, because I know there are some other systems that are like one day. And it's like, who would pay for that? Right. I've had people in this area, because if your house is... Um, if it's air conditioned, you're, you're pretty much just looking at keeping the thing steady. It, I know people that have had these for a year or two. Um, as long as they don't get hard, crumbly, then you don't have to worry about it. Right. Right. So that's how you know. 
But anyway, so um, like I said, even if it was thirty dollars a year, um, it's worth it when it's a you know two thousand dollar guitar. And I say two thousand dollars, I paid fifteen hundred bucks. But anyway, um, so what am I getting at? My my choice for the for the Gibson was based on um, I, I went through a lot of guitars. We talked about this ad infinitum when we on the on the lost episodes. So yeah, just, there was he, he played something like. 150 guitars over yeah. you know two years or literally something. I, I played them in other stores played them in our store but i spent two years playing guitars everywhere martin's and it, what happened was i started at the low end right i started with the, the inexpensive one and i started working up but once i once i played a 500 martin i was like now i can't play a 400 whatever and then once i played an 800 dollars martin and then I'm in the Taylors as well. Then I'm like, now I can't play anything but Martins and Taylors. Because you then realize where the quality the, level is. And yeah. Yeah. Then I got into the thousands and I said, ah, crap. Now I can't play anything but Martin Taylor Gibson and, and high end Breed Love and uh, the PRSs that you mentioned. Even the Angelus, the uh, SE Angelus is a nice guitar. Yeah. Um, I would I would check those out if I was you. Yeah, I've played so, a couple already, actually. Yeah, and um, what I found as I moved up is, and, and um, I think anybody would agree with me on this, as you pay more for an acoustic, you get more. Yeah, you do, definitely. Um, not to say that you can't find uh, an acoustic with the right vibe at a lower price, or you can't make it work for you or what you do. But I will say that the quality level goes consistently higher. And it's not like an electric guitars where when you hit like that one price ceiling, it's all just aesthetics on top of that. I mean, I have played. I think the most expensive acoustic plays about 5K. And I'll be honest with you, like that was like playing a piano compared like a like a Steinway Grand piano compared to playing like a Yamaha upright, you know. At like 400 bucks it's just like not even the same thing um and it's and it has to do with playability but it's mostly about tone like seriously what yeah. you pay what you get i you can get a really nice super playable guitar for next to nothing um but to get to the level where you've got all the sparkle and that fat low end and the big boomy thing and uh some nice you know some nice mid characteristics you're gonna pay um yeah. and if and and like jim said be careful don't go into the store and pick up the thousand dollar guitars and then and then pick up the three hundred dollar guitar and expect to have the same experience because what will happen right. is you'll pick up the thousand dollar martin and you'll go holy crap like this is really good and it's a martin right so thousand dollar martin is nothing right and then yep. you go down and you pay that play like the um was it the um yamaha or the, well i'm like the low end martin right like a 004 or something oh yeah and it's like up. it's like what or the uh, X series yeah it's yeah. like what is the, what even is this um i've had some pretty good experiences with sigma which is Mar well, like yeah. martin's old off brand and then yeah. um i actually really like um seagull for inexpensive stuff um yeah and breed love i mean i i honestly think breed love's got some especially when they do like special editions uh, a yeah. lot of times the special editions are really freaking good and they're like imported from China or wherever. And it's, you know, all the quality controls done here. And by the time they get to you, like they're really good guitars. Um, I think um, I think Martin kind of tips into the nice category. Anywhere between depending on the sale prices, anywhere between 12 and 1800. Yeah, now you're into yeah. a nice guitar that will last you a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, will it be? The greatest Martin that ever existed? No. But if you get one of those Oven Call uh, Martins or the um, – they they make uh, uh, solid uh, spruce and Sitka tops and stuff like that in that price range, you're, you're, you're buying a decent one. And the same with Taylor. It's in that same price point. You're going to start stepping into Taylor. It all depends. Like you're buying a parlor for specific sonic range. Mm -hmm. And I think that I don't, I don't know if you mentioned that it's this guitar doesn't step on my voice. I have high singing voice and it doesn't step all over me. 
Yeah, it doesn't have the um, crazy treble thing that happens where your voice is at. Yep. And it, and yet it wouldn't step on me if I had a low booming thing either. Right. And that's the thing that Martin does. It knows that it needs to fit a sonic um, space that is not really going to step on a vocal. I mean, a guy like Johnny Cash used a neck a baritone all day long. Mm-hmm. Who used a Martin, right? Yeah, yeah. And, well, and then of course there's you know Gibson acoustics have their own their own vibe too. Yeah, we were talking about how they fit different genres, um, and I think I think that's absolutely something we should reference here is the fact that like Taylor tends to be like the more modern guitar, whereas Martin is like I see that as the '70s rocker guitar. You see a lot yeah. of like bands from that time period. And of course, it also gets used in other in other genres as well. Um, I've seen jazz players using Martins and stuff, and I think Gibson yeah. tends to be like more kind of old school country um yep. in that kind of era although you'll see martin crossover and you'll see gibson crossover as well in both of those genres of but i think that's kind of like the staples for that for that kind of stuff and then you see these new companies like breed love and you're just like how do they even fit into this yet they don't they don't yet well, um yeah and and uh kind of put the the nail in the you know in the, in the acoustic thing is a. Uh, uh, when you when you look at any of these, you think about what Martin did. Martin Martin and Gibson were making these things back in the 1800s, right? Right. And Martin <clears throat> was uh, making parlors at the time, right? Because it literally the the name indicates where it was where it was used for most of the time. Um, families would gather in the parlor, and they would play music. It, it was a guitar for and entertaining. We, Small groups of people. It would be a guitar, a fiddle, a piano, maybe all three. Um, and, you know, and they would do that. So when you take uh, the, uh, when you take the um, the history, if you look at Martin's history, they were kind of pushed into doing dreadnoughts. That was not their thing. Yeah. That that's was... when the D series came out. Right. Yeah, go ahead. That happened because they needed louder guitars. I mean, we, yeah. that's how we ended up with electric guitars, quite frankly, is that they couldn't make acoustic yeah. guitars. Even steel, stringing them with steel strings was not loud enough to perform with horns or, you know, whatever other type of music you were you were dealing with, even in a symph- symphony. I mean, it's funny because if you look in the acoustic world, you look at model names, you'll often hear things like Grand Symphony. Um, yep. And that's because they're they're saying that that guitar should be looked at as something that can play in that size venue acoustically. And, and when you look back then, they were typically more than one guitar player. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Before um, the electrics, you'd have two, three, four guitar players. Yeah, and they would all be doubled up just to, yeah. just to make it bunch through because there's the yeah. only way you could get a louder and project and fill out a fill out a venue. So that's, I mean, that's the interesting part of this is like we live in a world where the acoustic sonic because i'm sure there's some people who are screaming at the the podcast right now going why yeah. don't you just buy an acoustic sonic because i actually want to use this as an acoustic guitar yeah <laughs> that's, that's not the acoustic sonic uh yeah that's okay so we're in an hour i think we got let's let's try to go for an hour and a half well we're at 50 minutes but let's try to go for an hour and a half and uh i think you've got at least 40 minutes of explaining to do um, I got some planning to do, Lucy. So, um, the uh, um, as you see, the flying V is not behind me. I still have it. Um, I dropped it off to have her looked at. Um, it is. Why can't it, it be is, a he? Uh, he is. I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna call him Charles. Um, Manson. Anyway, I mean, it would go along with maybe, the look. Maybe I'll call him. Maybe I'll call him Tyrion. He drinks and he knows things, and he's ugly. Um, <laughs> and he's ugly. Yep, and he's kind of kind of small, but he's not light. He's <laughs> nope. Not light. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. I'd probably just named him after one of the dragons, Viserion. Um, so uh, yeah, it's in the shop. Um, I'm having it set up professionally the first time in probably 20 years. Uh, somebody tried to. Uh, crown the frets and the neck was bowed it had a back bow and uh they did a fret level on it so it the neck was back bowed and you can imagine what happens when that happens 
So now there's high ends at frets. <laughs> yeah, on the uh, <laughs> high ends by the pickups and high ends by the nut and uh, low frets in between. Well, at least and it, you know, at least he can play above the twelve. <laughs> Every one of them is shaped like this because whoever <laughs> crowned them was worried about the middle and not the edges, <laughs> so he didn't crumble. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a disaster! It was a fret unleveling. It's, it's a revert. What would they call that? A reverse compound radius? Yes, it is actually a reverse compound radius. So bending notes was impossible, nigh impossible. Um, but I, you know, um, I'm obviously keeping the guitar. I didn't. Ju I I paid good money for it, and now I'm putting a lot of money into the frets. Probably going to cost me three, four, five hundred dollars. That's part of buying a vintage guitar. You're always going to put money in them yeah. when you get them. Yep. So it's getting a fret job needs it. it's 39 years old it was a player um so and uh so that's going on then my spark came in as i think i did mention but i did a video on it now people want me to do a video on the on the app and i'm having one heck of a time with that the app is just <laughs> the app is useful okay but it is it's it's the joyo pedal of apps Okay. <laughs> well, let's it's, talk about the noise well, suppressor. Yeah, so um I mentioned this in the video. I'm trying to trying to get it together. Every single um with the exception of maybe two, every single preset has a noise suppressor in it. Noise gate. And what's that tell you? What the, what what if you had any experience with bias products, meaning um What's the name of the company again? Uh, I can't. Positive Grid. Escape, positive Grid. If you've had any experience with Positive Grid and its biased products, you know they're noisy. They're noisy as hell. Like, I've had yep. lawnmowers that are quieter. Um, they're just the whole time your guitar is plugged in, and it doesn't matter if it's humbuckers. It doesn't matter how well grounded your system is. It's just noisy. I don't know why that is, but I have a theory, and my theory is that they have a high pass uh, filter that's actually raising up all the treble to make it give it that perceived clarity, which is really yeah. not clarity. Okay. Cause I'll be honest with you. No, high end. If you've played amps before, you know that more high end isn't necessarily clarity. Um, <laughs> it, it helps. Uh, and it can give you a perceived feeling of that, but, but that's only going to help you when you're comparing it to other modelers. Cause it doesn't sound like a real yeah. amp. It's right. I, it's exaggerated treble, but that I think is part of the reason why it has this enhanced hiss and noise that requires uh, a noise gate for every patch. Yeah. Um, what I did. It, it, here's my problem with a noise gate, folks. It's their noise gate, which which is it's doing what a noise gate does. I'm not saying it doesn't. Um, is it kills your signal almost immediately? The Stratocaster. Um, I can't get more than three or four seconds of, of uh, sustain and a, and a note dies. Um, and what's that tell you? That, that just says that all they're doing is suppressing, uh, they're compressing your sound and suppressing the, the hiss. But by doing that, the threshold is, is like this. It's right up here. It's, it's terrible. Um, I turn it off. I turn it off. Um, I don't care about the hiss. Um, it's just like an amplifier. You're going to get some hiss. So I turn it off and I play. Um, so what else? Uh, what it's else like a I PV find? Windsor. If you're familiar yeah. with a PV Windsor, <laughs> they're noisy. Sometimes the noise is louder than you're playing. Um, I'm sure they're going to add some effects, but there is there are not a lot of effects in there. There's not. Um, yeah, this thing is supposed to go up against. It's for some people now. I don't think anybody. Uh, really thinks this is a katana killer. No, the they, katana don't sit in the same place. You don't put a katana on your desk. I think this is the new Line Six Amplify. Is what yeah. I think this is. Yeah, or the THX, the TH, THR, THR, THR. Yeah. Um, but the THR. So here's the interesting THR in this. THR, you don't have to have the app. Right. <laughs> the yeah. controls are all and right there. Yeah, the controls are there. The controls are here, but you don't have an ability to change like which delay you're using unless you use the app. And if you don't have the app up and you don't set those as one of your presets, when you reboot this thing, when you turn it back on, 
whatever you had before, unless it's one of the saved ones, not getting it back yeah. without the app. Um, so there are some things, like I said, I'll go, I'm going to get into detail in the video, but um, I give it a solid B. I, I, the hype, you're the not hype train is definitely there. You're not going to expect this thing to be anything more than a practice amp. Like, no. as a practice amp, is it still a B? Honestly, uh, my impression of it from talking to Jim is it's still a B as a practice amp. Yeah, it's a B. I think... It, it, and it's no more than that. It is no more than that. You can get a lot more... Um, you know, honestly, here's my problem. I could just plug in... I could buy an interface... or a, I've got an interface. I mean, I buy, buy a um, uh, Helix Native for $99 or something like that and get just as much out of it. Okay. All right, here, here. Let me explain. So here's my hot take on this based on conversation with you. If I was to buy a car that would exemplify something like this, I would be buying yeah. a Fiat with a technology package. Small, economical car with a tech package, and it's going to have all yep. kinds of cool technical features in it, and I'll be able to watch stuff on the screen, and I'll be able to see backup camera front and back, and I'll have yep. heated mirrors, and I'll have, you know, all of the th bells and whistles you want on a car, in a luxury car, but it's still a shitty Fiat. I mean, you can't get well, away from the fact that it's still, it's like fails at the one thing that is cool, is being a damn car. Like, if you can't, it's like, it's like buying a guitar that does all these things, and does all these things, but it sucks as a guitar. It's like, what? Why are you buying this? For me, it's more like it has heated seats, but they only heat like the sides of your back. And <laughs> and it and maybe a little bit of the headrest. Like little annoying things. Yeah. Yeah. It, just enough. It's like, yeah, the, the mirrors are heated, but only the center defrosts and the outside is still. That's okay. what I. All right. That's what I get out of this. That's why it's a B. I can still see behind me. But not as well as I'd like to. Okay. You know what I mean? And and you know what? I'm not I'm not putting down Fiat owners. Like I would love to have an Abarth. No. Like a Fiat Barth sounds like a load of fun. But um yeah. and I believe me, I've thought about buying one more than once. Um, but uh I would probably buy a Mini Cooper S before I did that. But um it's just it, it just seems like a product that like doesn't really have the market appeal that they want it to. Um and I feel like this is a gateway product to get you to buy whatever bias amp two comes out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope so. I, I, the truth of the matter is that I, I've had it. I've had somebody say they might have a buyer for me, so I may sell it. For I don't help what I paid for. bias amp like their, their head thing. They didn't sell any of those. No one was interested. And I don't know yeah. anyone serious. Um, amongst my group of people that I hang out with and talk to online stuff that's using bias as their recording solution um, for, for electric guitars. I'm sure people are doing it. Um, and I'm sure there's good tones to be had. And like I've had, I've played with bias effects and stuff and um, it's, it's okay. But you know what? I compare it to like the stuff you get in the logic for free. And that's where I'm like, eh. I mean, Line six, the the um, native is a way better tool for recording direct guitar, way better. However, it yeah. has its problems, too. Um, it can be inconsistent if you're feeding at different volume levels. It can be it can be dramatically different. Um, and it's a resource hog. And there have been yeah, times where they've updated it and then it just stopped working, basically. Um, so that's a whole well other. Commentary. What this is for, if you're a, if you're a, um, I, I knew an ophthalmologist I had. Is that the right word for the eye doctor, ophthalmologist? Mm -hmm. Um, who optometrist, had, right? Optometrist. optometrist. What the heck is an ophthalmologist? I think an ophthalmologist is also an eye doctor, but I think that's like somebody who does eye they surgery, do surgery stuff like that. No, this was like an opto. This was an optometrist. Anyway, so the, well, he was an ophthalmologist as well. He was looking at doing surgery of eyes. But anyway, so um. Uh, I went in and he had a little desk amp and he had a really nice guitar in his office. And I said, wow, it's a nice guitar. And, and, and then he says, oh, thanks. And then I said, oh, that's crappy. amp." he goes, yeah, I got a better one at home. <laughs> but that, I hope <laughs> this, is, this is what I picture 
in the current environment, if you're stuck, where you're at your desk, you don't have an interface device. You don't have all that stuff. You just need something to sit on the desktop and play through at lower volumes or through your headphones or into the computer. This is fine. I think that if you want to know who this is for, go to Bias's website, pull up the page, look at the pictures, yep. because they get the marketing really right. This is for the hipster yep. guy that lives in the studio apartment in the city somewhere. He can't have yep. a real amp. It would right. be too inconvenient for his lifestyle, and it doesn't really fit in his place, and it would be disruptive to the neighbors, um, and maybe his girlfriend, right? And so, like... Right. He buys the Spark because he can just plug in headphones or use it very quietly and have a room filling sound. It's the same market. And that's what's dumb about this. It's the same market as the THR. It's the same market as the Fender Mustang. It's the same market. Right. We forgot the Mustang is also a full range system um, that's supposed to do the same thing. And yep. when you start looking at it from that perspective, it's really funny how how similar the marketing is for these products in different companies. Like the Fender marketing, if you remember, they had the guy with the man bun and he was playing the Mustang in his apartment. And um, yep. it was like it was all IKEA furniture in the background. So if that's you, the Spark is probably your amp. Yeah, um, it is. And and the um the other side of it and uh, uh is that the acoustic setting is completely useless. You're, if you have an acoustic guitar, you can hear it. Okay? I'm just saying. Unless you're using it as a DAW, that's the only thing I can think of where it comes in as useful because now you're plugged in and you can go through the DAW and you can go through the thing and you're you're recording it. Because why, why do you need a dinky little 40-watt amp to amplify something that already makes noise well that was another that was another thought i had about the acoustic guitar thing is like when i buy my acoustic electric should i buy an amplifier like an actual honest to god died in the wool acoustic amplifier i know there are different companies that make them i like the fishman loud box i think that get a di i was gonna do that anyway um i'm gonna get that that meave di that one that's like 300 bucks the the loud box is great if you get the the small one it's it's fantastic they it sound is literally cool. a loud box. If you need something bigger than that, you're going to go DI to the box to the to the board anyway. Sure, sure. Uh, well, the only reason I'd want to have it is like family gatherings and stuff. Yep. Um, it'll help yep. me to get hurt a little bit. Um, because I do exactly. play for family occasionally, although I'm disowning a lot of them every day. So, um, he's running out. Whole, the end of this week to be on a family. That's a whole lot. Well, no, a lot of them are snoozed, and like I forgot they existed. And like every 30 days, they come back in my Facebook feed and I'm like, oh, I forgot about you. <laughs> there you are. Snooze. Um, yep. So. Oh, I see what you've been trying to say. Snooze again. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. It's like, I don't need this negativity in my life. Um, nope. I have I have signed off on it. <laughs> so. Uh, but anyway, as far as the Spark's concerned, One, like it works OK as an acoustic amp. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's fine for what it does. Um, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it for an acoustic amp. I would use it if I was trying to interface the acoustic, and that's about it. And I'll and I'll go in deeper on that. I'll I'll even show you know recording it. So now, obviously, what's missing? There's my Fender, my Mark, my Marshall right there. You can see the corner of it. And there's my Spar. Oh, there's no, there's no big there's no gold line helix. So I returned Helix. Um, I'm not happy or sad about it. Um, I didn't. I didn't stay with the '80s band. You weren't invested in it. Nope. But I did keep my uh, my Alto my Alto inside it's sitting there. You can see it. Um, I just uh, it, it did not. I, I respect everybody who uses a Helix. I really do. I, I, There's I a lot of effort find... that goes into programming it, to understanding yep. it, to having the time to learn to use it. I spent two years with it, and I still felt like I barely scratched the surface. Yep. I definitely, it was not. Yeah, go ahead. I definitely think if you if you buy one and you spend time with it, like you can get usable stuff out of it. And I know that for a fact. Yep. I mean, Jeff B, he has... 
had a helix off and on for you know and, and both the stomp and uh, i think he had an lt at one point too um yeah has had the helix off and on in some capacity for you know a year or so or two years and he's got some patches that are dialed in like i was like wow i can't believe that's coming out of that thing but then i could never get mine to sound like that no matter how much tweaking i did and i don't know whether it was like i just didn't know what i wanted to get out of it or whether it was just that option paralysis like confused the crap out of me um I just couldn't I couldn't make it work for me. The workflow just did not work. There was so much stuff there. I literally downloaded Richie Castellano's um settings. He he had a YouTube he had YouTube videos. He said, if you want this setting, this is the setting, this is the setting. And he played it where the guitar was sitting by itself. I got it. I plugged it. I didn't mess with his settings at all. Matter of fact, I went through the the effort of buying the own hammer. Uh, IR the same impulse responses, yeah, that he had, so that I could get the own hammer. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, the so GNR, the open. GNR, yeah, the massively multi mic cab. That cabinet is amazing. Yeah. You will be glad you have that one. Yeah, at some point you're I will gonna... when I get my Kemper. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you will be because if you get some DI profiles, that's gonna be your that's gonna be your bread and butter right there. Yeah. And so I loved the IR, but I could not get the sounds to me. And it should have been easy because it's it's me coming out of a set of speakers and him coming out of a set of speakers. Same, I mean, same full range sound. I well, should have been able to. Yes and no. So there is one component there that you're forgetting, and that is that the uh speaker curve of like the alto um speakers versus like, I don't know, a nice Friedman cab or the line six satellite speakers, which Castellano uses in some of his videos or things like that. But he was they're quite a bit yeah. different. But he remember he's using that directly in the you know in the video what you hear is direct. Right. So he so if you were going to if you're going to do an apples to apples comparison I think that actually the a flat pair of studio headphones would have been yeah, would have been great for you to to like demo it with cuz that's what I yeah. did. When I I went to the store I took these guys I sat on the floor with both it and the head rush like back to back and I had headphones plugged into it and I was like, okay, now I can kind of get an idea of what's really going on here. And yeah. um, that's how I made my decision initially. But, um, and that's, yeah. And again, I wanted to be able to, you got to remember, I would have been great. Hey, uh, now everybody in the audience put these headphones on. Cause that's the only way you're going to hear me. Right. 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 Well, that. you can use the so, global EQ to tweak that later, but that's, that's kind of yeah. what was my logic behind it. It was like, you got to use the global EQ to tweak for your sound system. But, um, and I found some, don't get me wrong. I found some usable sounds. It's just that it wasn't. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. How many amps in there did you think you would end up using? I mean, like you've seen, you know, this, you've seen the list of models now. How many do you, yeah. uh, you, do you think are like totally redundant? A lot of them. I, I, I found maybe four, five useful, like, settings right and they were mostly marshall and and uh a uh, couple of fenders yeah I mean, but the th how many how many marshals are there in that thing too many there were too many marshals. there's like 11 marshals it's nuts and they were all the same well they were like, all well, it's like one channel the other channel jumpered you yeah. didn't have to do that because i'll tell you right now just give us the jumpered we'll turn the normal gain all the way down and then we'll have the same sound like, yeah, I, I, theoretically, that should be basically the same sound. That's the same thing. Right. Um, the other problem I have is. We got the tremolo amp, like the trem the, the yeah. plexi tremolo. Look, I know people like the plexi tremolo stuff. I know that people like the bass plexis and stuff. All of those things have made appearances in line six products. Listen, line six, just give us a good goddamn plexi. We don't yeah. need. And they did. The plexi's decent. But but we don't need three other ones afterwards. What the hell is it? Who is this for? Who is right. this actually for? Um, yeah. and 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 that was my complaint. And of course, when you get, and and you look at how it's geared, right? So, in my mind, um, and this is going to sound like heresy, but Strymon got it right in that ninety percent of your sounds are covered by three groups of amps: a Fender yep. amp, a Box amp, and a Marshall amp. Marshall amp. 
Now, granted, I kind of wish that they had gone one step further and added a modern Mesa Boogie style amp. Um, and that would have been your four sounds to cover, you know, to cover them all. Four sounds to rule them all. And I and I feel yeah. like inside of uh, inside the Helix, beautiful. like it's very weighted in a high gain direction for all the genders. And yep. I also felt like the clean sounds that were in there were not distinctly different. And they're all way too freaking dirty. Um, like a, a deluxe free verb on three is not so is not totally distorted. That's crazy. There's nothing about that model that screams accuracy to me. Um, yep. And I feel like a hypocrite because I tried for two years to get along with Helix. And I would, there were times where I would like go through this excitement, like, yeah, I'm going to make it work for me. And I've gotten some good sounds out of it. So now I know I can like get a lot of good sounds out of it. And I can remember doing an episode where I talked about now we're just going to try to use the Helix to make good sounds instead of trying to be accurate. And that was like a big, you know, revelation point. And I know um, one of our show listeners actually came to see me and I showed him um, some stuff. And I was like, you know what? This sounds really great. I just got the Helix. Like I hadn't had it that long. And now I realize like the sound that I showed him was like probably the most cartoony amp model in the whole thing. Because I played the real amp since then. Or, you know, I've heard clips of it at least. And I'm like, that's not really what it sounds like. This is like way overblown. Yeah. And um, I think that when it comes to that, whether it's the Helix, the the uh, Kemper, whatever, um, the most important thing is can you get can you get a usable sound out of it? Can you make it sound right? That right. It's useful in your application. Yeah, I just feel like they've made some really bad decisions in terms of when they add things. Because, um, like, okay, so I just looked at the holes in the lineup in the Helix. The JCM eight hundred model in there is not good. Um, so I know that when I had it, they got they got the Friedman BEOD model, which was okay. And then I think the next round we got the Friedman clean version. So like it was the clean side. And then they added the rev. And I'm like, what the hell do we need a yeah. rev for? We have a great Mason book, like a like a great uh rectifier in here already. Because the rev height, man. Come well, on. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like it didn't make any sense. What they should have done is say, we have a hole in our lineup. This is what we need to fill in. No, instead they're just looking to looking at the hype machine and going, well, everybody's going to buy it because we got a rev model. So let's we do that instead. In Revs are selling. My problem is that this amp was supposed to be the professional piece of the Line Six lineup. That works great in a pod go, right? It's like this is the amp everybody wants. We can provide this model to them, and then everybody could be happy. Or we can do, you know, the full on Helix, and then the pros are mad because they don't have what they need, I right? I think we're I think we're on the cusp of sealing the new Helix because of the fact that the, the new pod, what is it? The pod the pod go go has Helix modeling um, in it. Yeah. Thorne, Pete Thorne did a pod go thing where he took his guitar and he said, okay, doing the this um patch of the Helix, which now you can share patches. So he took the patch from the Helix, put it in the pod go, same IR, same interface, did the tube back to back. You can not tell the difference cannot yeah the only now, difference is know, really the flexibility and routing but right i was about to say you know that there's that whole flexibility and routing which that whole but, flexibility and routing thing is bullshit the only reason that even exists is because they couldn't figure out a way to get the two processors to play nice and and get you to be able to use both cores at the same time it's bullshit that that uh, that's one of the misleading things about Helix that that like really irritates me is that Fractal could do that and they would use one UI to unite them all. You wouldn't have two chains. You wouldn't have to do all this fancy routing to get to use two amps and and you know a pre chain and a post chain and all these different things. It's just not necessary. They that's a UI disaster in my opinion. Yeah, but I think that um, you know when you look at it for the for the user like myself and what I was getting ready to do. Um, pod go made more sense. Do you think the pod and go competes with the HX stomp at all for a third of the money? Well, that's what I, I'm saying. I like, honestly do. For the I think that the only difference between the pod go and the HX stomp, HX stomp sits in the, in the same category as it's the, a jack of all trades pedal board thing. The, the pedal, right. You could stick it on your pedal board. It's small enough. Stick it on your pedal board. Yeah. Can't it's, do that with a, with a pod go. I really believe it's a product they need. I mean, I, I think that I think that's more important than even so 
I, you know, the one that the one loser product they brought out, and I and I, I'll call it this. I know we've got users in the group who have them, but that HX effects, that thing is a loser. And the reason is because they brought that out and then they turned around and they gave you the same Swiss Army knife functionality in the HX stomp. What the hell was the point of the, the, the HX effects? Here, have all the crap in Helix except for the one thing that matters, which is the amp models. So now you can yeah. pay the same amount or you can pay this amount exactly. yeah. and get and get the ability to use amp models. Because nobody's nobody I know bought an HX effects and didn't put it on their board next to like two other pedals or three other pedals. Exactly. You know, like I, I honestly I think that was just a, a dumb pro it was like, well, we gotta we gotta have something for people who use the M13. Yeah. It's really just the M M13 replacement. Yeah. Um I'm yeah, I think the I think the good the if you look at the price point, the the go is for the person that doesn't want to bring a bunch of pedals, just wants to bring the one thing. Where the stop is, hey, this fits on your pedal board. You can integrate it into your thing. It is your amp in a box, IR modeler in a box. You're, yeah, we've got some effects in there, but you probably won't use them. Yeah, I hadn't even looked at the pod go until just now. This is like way more Helix than I expected. Like yeah. even in the UI is the basically the Helix LT model. Um, but they don't give you the flexible routing. It's probably only one signal chain. It's this one is an signal. HX stomp with an Think expression about it. an a, expression pedal. That's right. And that's and more and more uh, uh buttons. A bigger screen. Yep. I don't that's know. What, I mean, these are this is a cool, cool box. I, I yeah. honestly I think four fifty is a little steep for me to buy anything with the word pod on it. And I and I think that's just because of resale value. But, yeah, but, but I, um, I think this is I think this is going to be um, honestly, this would be for me, this would be the LT killer, unless you really needed that stereo second thing. Yeah, because this gives you the ability to do amps too, and I'm sure you can probably disable amp modeling it as well. And you've got and you've got IR loading in there, which they didn't have before. Now you've got amps and IRs, and you've see, got all the amps. And you can load all the IRs, not as many at a time, but you can load IRs and amps just like you can. When he, that's why this is, to me, this is an LT killer. I think this product is, uh, honestly, if, if you're buying, if you're looking at buying an HX and a full size Helix, ask yourself how, how complicated do you need the routing to get? Um, that's right. Honestly, think this is probably going to fit the bill for you. Uh, I yep. can't, I mean, most people don't have needs for like four outputs or six outputs to do different things. And I don't think the interface side of it is a compelling enough argument to say, well, I really need the USB recording interface that Helix gives me. Um, I know this probably does that anyway, because I see there's a USB out. Um, I'm just looking at the, so you only get one effects loop. Well, reality is you really only need one effects loop. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, on the Helix, I think I only ever used two, and that was for a demo video. Um, I really think this is probably a a winner product for them over over the Helix. Now, the thing that sucks though, it's like you said. I think you're absolutely right. I think this signals the end of the end of the Helix in terms of the current generation. I think they're getting ready for Helix two already, um, which really really sucks because if people put out seventeen hundred dollars on a modeler. And you're going to turn around and, and dump another one on the market five, six years later. I mean, I guess that's a good product life cycle. But in terms of gear and the way that things have gone previously, I mean, it was a seven or eight year product life cycle. And quite frankly, like I would expect them when they launch, it'll be different than the last launch because I think you're going to see the big form factor. I don't think there'll be an LT in the lineup. Um, I think you'll see the big form factor. You'll see a stomp. And then... Um, you might see something like the big form factor without an expression pedal. And that's it. Oh, and the, of course the rack you'll have, you will have the rack that'll absolutely happen. Yeah. That the rack is a necessity for a lot of, the, but, but, the she, but, she, but you know what? I mean, honestly, without even having heard one in person, I think the fractal is still a better, better product at this point. Um, in the sense that, yeah, you got to deal with cliff. You got to order something sight unseen. That sucks, right? But I mean, it's nine. Yeah, it's, it's nine ninety nine, Jim. The FM three yeah. is nine ninety nine. That's compelling as hell compared to yeah, the full size Helix. It is. It's it's definitely compelling. There's if there's two things that's that's pulling me right now, it's that and the uh, 
and the Kemper. Well, we have people in the group that actually have FM3s. So I would yeah. highly recommend you talk to some of those individuals and get some opinions. Yeah. Um, and Jeff has used my Kemper as well. So he'll be able to give you some comparisons. Um, yeah, that would be that would be good input. And that's why I'm saying like, reach out to him because because he has info for you, I'm sure. Um, sure. But um, honestly, like if I was in the market for a budget modeler, this is the way to go. The the pod go. I mean, it, like I said, sure. it's a little bit expensive, um, but it's line six. You can get a deal on line six products if you ask politely. Um, and uh, I think I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, this is what they needed. You know, I, I was kind of complaining that the stomp was not. It, it missed right. a couple features. It didn't have enough. It didn't have enough foot switches. It didn't have a great UI that you could dial in from the unit itself. This has got all that, and it's not that big in footprint. So, yeah. um, I I hope yeah, Kemper I comes stop, out with something is, similar. Yeah, I I think the stop is going to sit where it does because it's still useful for that person that just wants either just to bring that little thing that can fit literally in your back pocket. Um, or on the corner of your board, uh, where I think that this is going to be the one that quote unquote, uh, rules them all. And that it, it allows you to have that bridge that you wanted the more buttons of the LT, but you didn't need all the crap that came along with it, all the baggage, all the weight, all the size, but you didn't have enough controls for your foot on the stop and you had to go buy, you know, other stuff. I think this is going to be a good one. One thing to keep in mind, um, other products at similar price points that do kind of what um, the PodGo does. First off, if you are buying a Line 6 Firehawk, Firehawk FX right now, don't. Um, that's dumb. Oh. Let them eat that loss because um, yep. I've heard those things did not sell. Um, I'm just looking here. So there's a reason for that. This is this is the this is the point. I'll, I'll I'll get around to the the real point of what I'm saying here in a second. But um, so we got the Line Six Pod Go. Um, there's the Hotone Hot One, Ampero Amp Modeler, which is now five hundred dollars. It's China tariffs, right? Um, Boss GT One Hundred. The GT One is like three fifty. I think it's less than the um than the uh pod go there's the head rush gig board which is 650 so now we're out of the territory right and i think the head brush gig board at 650 is not really a good price um if they drop that down about 200 bucks it would become very compelling um which they might in the face of the pod go um because i think people sort of see head rush as competing with the pod series of stuff pod. less yeah. than less than the professional level um and then, of course, you get in the Halix Stomp at $600 as well. So here's, here's the funny part, right? So Strymon's Iridium, which is three amp yep. models, they're quality amp models. Like, you can use this in a professional situation. $400, right? Yep. It is only $50 cheaper than getting a Podgo at this point. And I think the Podgo is a compelling... I think that makes the Podgo a compelling thing. They went for Strymon's throat. I, they they have bad blood with Strymon anyway because I don't know if you know it's all former Line Six engineers. Um, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, they were a company called Damage Control first, and then they spun off into Strymon, um, which is it's all former Line Six people. Um, which is the people that designed the famous like venerable like multi delay box and all those different things went off and formed Strymon. Um, I think just post the Yamaha transition, most of them left. Um, so. That's what's really funny is it's clear that line six like took a look at what Strymon was doing and was like, how can we price this? I'm sure this product was already in the works, but they were like, how can we price this to compete with the Strymon Iridium? And it's like, well, we'll just 50 bucks more. You get effects. And it's Helix Amp modeling. So, I mean, immediately that's like whole level, a whole other level of stuff. Um, One thing I did want to ask you about before we start wrapping up. So the Helix, you had it for a while. You played with the um, delays and reverbs. What did you think of the delays and reverbs? Jeez, you know, I sh <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. Um, it really is. I 
so I'd seen videos where people, you know, because they always compared them to like the big sky or the um, timeline and stuff like that, right? I'll be honest with you. I, I was not impressed with the delays or reverbs. Do you want me to tell None you why? Of- you want me to tell you why? Sure. <laughs> because they're all the legacy reverbs from the M9 and the M13 and and which are the reverbs and delays that were in the uh, multi stop series. Right. Which is hilarious to me. They're using 20 year old algorithms in a professional level product because some professionals still use those original things that they that they're very familiar with. Um, and then they did the reverb update because people were crying because they were like the reverbs in here suck. And they did a reverb update and all of the reverbs are like spacey, like like I what I call church reverbs, you know, um, because of praise and worship music often uses these big patty reverbs, you know, and I'm like, where's my plate? Like, where's my simple hall reverb? Like, what the hell? Yeah. Um, where's my and simple spring? Instead, it's all instead it's all like uh, shimmer verbs and stuff. And you're like, yep. wait a minute. So you give us six verbs that are supposed to replace and be like the helix verbs, right? And they're they're garbage. They're they're like twenty years out of date. You What's know? that one that starts with the G that's in there? The the uh, gramamine, the granamine, the something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, I don't know what Garmin lights. I don't don't remember what the name was, but I just honestly, I think I tried him one Ganymede. I think I tried him one time and then I was like, no, none of these are for me. Searchlights was one of them, I think. Yeah. Ganymede. And then something else. And I was like, these are useless. And the delays are not much better. I mean, the delay, the delays are helix delays, but they, they really don't feel modern. They feel kind of crappy, in my opinion. Um, no, they, it, I I only used I well, so they came out with an update, and when they came out with like the Cosmos delay, which is their version of a uh, Roland Space Echo, that was okay. Yeah. That was yeah. okay, but there was like a dozen or so that I was just like, wow, this is really dark. It doesn't sound good. Like, yeah, I lose a lot of detail in the repeats. That's, um, that's where I was. Like we we had talked um, a while back about delays and how that's one of the few pedals you shouldn't be able to fuck up, and they fucked it up. They they totally screwed the pooch on delays and reverbs. So according and, to Jeff, like the FM three, del- I need to get in there when he's got his FM three at the shop. Uh, according yeah. to Jeff, the delays and reverbs in the um in the FM three are so good that like it. It, it just basically killed his ability to use a use an HX stomp at this point. And on top of that, um, they're notoriously good because on the older platform, the AX8, they used to like max out the processor almost immediately. You couldn't use like two reverbs on one patch because it would because it would just eat all your CPU ability. Um, and I, if you didn't know this, like reverb is pretty much like the most intense algorithm that and, and and it can be done different ways, obviously, but um, to get a really good high quality reverb, like that's why people want to use discrete reverbs because generally you need that processing power just for the reverb. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I I didn't. I guess the problem is I, whenever I'm playing it, I'm thinking about what I feel like and what I play like when I'm going through the Fender or going through the Marshall. And that was really where I was I was uninspired completely. I was just completely like, Muh. you know what I mean? I I honestly think a lot of it's the preamp design on the Helix. I don't think it lets the guitar shine through really well. I am fairly certain that that the experience with a Variax, which I should know this better. I played Variaxes through the Helix before. I've done it at Gear Fest. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, of course, it's a tiny headphone rig and there's all this stuff going on. I think it's the same headphones I have on right now. Or the uh, the uh, Yamaha equivalents, which I have those at work, um, so I know those very well as well. Uh, they just don't have enough isolation for uh, like a big event like that, and it would have been nice to be able to hear like what a Variax really sounds like. But but it right. was I can remember it being very present and very clear, and I don't remember ever plugging a guitar into the Helix and hearing like lots of clarity coming out. Right, just being kind of like, 
doesn't sound like we plug it directly in my amp. Actually, when um when I first got it, I had imagined that was going on, and then I started bypassing it, and I started like just plugging directly into the amp when I was bored and stuff. And there was a period where I didn't play my real amps for about six months, and I plugged into my Mark V, and I was like, "What am I doing with this thing?" And that was right before I sold it. I was like, "This is terrible. It doesn't it doesn't have any of the dynamics and stuff that you get from an amplifier." In the in the sense like the relationship that your your hands form with the amplifier, um, yeah. Whereas like the Helix, I I I say this with all loving care because I know when you record you often have this experience anyway. But it was like playing a wet rag, and that's basically playing a recorded sound, right? I mean, um, if you've ever played through studio monitors with a with a modeler inside the thing, or even had your amp in another room and mic'd up and then routing it back to the thing, it kind of feels like playing a wet rag. So I think I think it does a really good job of doing that. But the problem is me as a player, I want those nuances of what happens when I pick harder versus softer. And I don't want them to purely be like volume nuances. I want to hear that right. aggression change and I want to hear all the other little attack things that go on. Um, and it's not this is not I want to stress this isn't an amp in the room thing. Like I'm not talking about like being hit in the chest or my pant legs blowing in the wind. I'm just talking about like what happens when I pick a note and how how quick the attack comes and how quickly it decays. And since having my Helix, this is something I did want to bring up as part of this conversation. Um, we didn't do it in the other episode, but we're going to do it now. And that is the the um, the decay on Helix with a good set of cans, solo guitar, guitar not bumping the input levels of the the um, interface enough to like even be close to clipping when you get the decay of a note coming out of helix there's a subtle distortion in it and it's like it's almost like um a bleed into a distortion channel which if you ever experience that like old marshalls sometimes do it where you'll plug into one channel and you have the volume down and you have the other channel turned up or whatever and then like the other the other volume will be turned up and what'll happen is you'll get some crosstalk and it and it's not super loud but it's like there's a distortion going on somewhere else, you know, inside the amp that's like bleeding back into what you're doing. Um, yeah, I noticed that. And I was like, that kind of kills it for me um, as a tool because it's like, I can't record with that. I mean, I'm going to, yeah. it's going to drive me nuts. Um, it's not going to drive the, the audience probably won't even notice it, but it's going to drive me crazy because I'm right. going to know it's there. And so I have kind of been shying away from using native lately. I've been using my campers. I can sit next to me and I've been doing some recording lately. Um, I'm, sp I'm supposed to be doing some old stumpy recording. Actually, it's like we're recording stuff, but apparently it's COVID. Everybody's recording, even if you're a cover band. So, um, yep. Um, that's the, that's everybody's got to put something together. Yeah. Well, there's that. And I got, so the Godin, uh, came back. Uh, I've had the volume knob swapped on that. So I'm ready to go for the P90 pickup giveaway. I'm trying to get that video done um, when work mm -hmm. is not so insane. Um, hopefully that will get done tomorrow night. Wink, wink, hopefully. Um, and in time to actually be tacked onto this episode because I want to get this out by the end of the week if I can to make up for the uh, lack of two episodes in a row. Um, yeah. But uh, we're recording on an odd night tonight. It's Wednesday. It's not Sunday. The Wednesday night, guys. Yeah, which is why my room it's is a disaster because we do all our cleaning on Saturday. Um, but uh, I've got a new puppy coming next, not this weekend, but next weekend. Yeah, I know. I so, keep seeing your pictures on uh, Facebook. Yeah, so on the 29th, I'm driving out to pick him up. Just out in Roanoke, Virginia. Don't get lost. No Croatoan. He'll be, he'll be sitting in my lap on uh, the the episode that i record after that for sure i'm sure because he'll he'll otherwise he'll be whining in a cage or a corner, so i'll try to get him to sleep before i start recording <laughs> well maybe we'll then i'll to, be up all night with him <laughs> maybe we'll have to schedule the episode earlier in the day so you know what to do um <laughs> exactly all right puppy's down for a nap let's go <laughs> all right well <laughs> the old, day, old days when i had the little kids yeah uh well believe me those days are not not a distant memory for me. My, my kids are fortunately 10 and uh, 15 now, but um, yeah. Yeah. I can remember babies. Thank goodness. My youngest are 20. They're going to be 21 in March. So if you guys have, cause like we've, we've done a lot of gear coverage this episode. If you guys have gear, you want us to look at or talk about, um, please 
join our Facebook group yeah. and drop us a line in there or you know, do it in the comments below this video if you're watching us on uh, YouTube. Um, yep. And we'll uh, we'll do our best to cover it. I mean, I, I have no real reservation talking about anything, even if it's, you know, uh, stuff I don't like or stuff that's like super cheap on Amazon. In fact, if it's super cheap on Amazon, there's a chance I might buy it and actually like give a real review yeah, of it. Yeah, then we could look at it. Um, exactly. But I believe me, I bought plenty of crap in my day. Um, I'm still looking at these uh, high-end models. I bought Bugs Bunny stamps today. I was like, th this is how bad my Amazon buying has gotten. I, I had something show up and I didn't know what it was. And I, and I, and then um, today, I was saying to my son, I was on my way to get something that I pre-ordered, um, and I and I said to him, I said, I bought something today. I can't remember what it was. Stamps. And I kept thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And I was like, oh, stamps. That's right, because I actually had to mail an envelope, and I, and I was like. Oh shucks! I need stamps, so I want the Bugs Bunny collection because they're same price. They were the same price, fifty five cents for stamps. So, I bought the Bugs Bunny collection. Hey, so I have no intention of keeping it. Excuse me. I see that Helix uh, or Kemper stages are in stock. Not are at, they? Not at Guitar Center. Oh, yeah. but that probably means Guitar Center's not far behind. Um. Probably not. Uh, did you did you check Guitar Center? No. But I would take I I'm serious. You should have that conversation with with uh, Jeff before you. Yep. In stock, summer. ready to ship. Oh crap. Okay. <laughs> I pointed out some awful things for Jim. Now, well, you could buy it, you could review it, and if it sucks, you could send it back. If you don't like it, yep. I mean, yep. that's basically it would be easy because it would sell in a minute anyway. One way or the other. Right. Yep. All yep. right. I'm a, I'm going to uh, end the episode. I'm David. All right. I'm Jim. And uh, tonight we were practically guitarists. Yes, we had. I guess. I, I don't even know anymore. <laughs>